Art's presentation, and um, I think he and I share a lot in common. I watched a presentation he made about miracles online. Uh, it was very good explaining the difference between God's primary action and his uh, in miraculous intervention, his ordinary way of upholding the laws of, of nature. And uh, I also agree with his um, uh, his understanding of the importance of the Christian faith and the foundation of modern science. Notions like the laws of nature are actually a very distinctively Christian idea, uh, a biblical idea, in fact. There's a great deal of scholarship on where that idea came from, going back to the book of Job. And, um, and so it isn't surprising that there are so many Christians in science. And I was encouraged there were even some believers at Oxford. Having been at Cambridge, we had the opposite view. So it's the, an old joke, right? Uh, no, that's, so, um, and I also very much agree with the idea that the laws of nature are a mode of divine action. In fact, that was a lot of what Newton was uh, arguing with Leibniz about. Um, and so those are some points of strong agreement. And, uh, and I, I like to point out some areas of divergence as well. Um, I, actually, one other thing, and, and that I think that Art frames this discussion about origins helpfully as well, he says, are the laws of nature that we see ordinarily at work, or mechanisms that we see at work, like the mutation selection mechanism in the case of biological evolution, are these sufficient to uh, explain what we see in the natural world, or is something else required? And I, um, I think that's a helpful way of framing it, because there are some things that we see in the, in the world where those, those laws or ordinary mechanisms are sufficient. I think the viruses that are in studies is a great example of a case where there are self-organizational processes at work. The stereochemical affinities between those proteins and their structure allows for this amazing kind of jigsaw puzzle fit and the things to actually assemble in, in real time right away. Okay? But there are, are a lot of other things where those kinds of self-organizational, law-like processes do not explain what we see and what is present in the natural world. And one of the central things that law-like processes do not explain is the origin of information. Um, I had another slide that I would put it, could have, would have showed, but remember my illustration with the magnets. Um, and the, um, it turns out that, that information is inherently aperiodic. Here, let's look at this guy. Um, it's something that is non-repetitive. Imagine a third string on this on this slide here, where the string is uh, um 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 o m o m o m o m o m. Okay. In information theory, that would be regarded as a redundant sequence, highly repetitive. But it could also be generated by a simple algorithm or law. The problem with trying to explain the origin of information is that information is inherently aperiodic. Laws of nature, by definition, describe patterns of repetitive order. Sunrise, sunset, all unsuspended bodies fall. Okay, repetitive patterns, that's what the laws of nature do. Information is not that kind of a beast. And for that reason, the attempt to explain information by reference to self-organizational processes analogous to those that are correctly invoked to explain viruses, do not work. And so in that particular case, and I like the way he frames this, are the laws of nature sufficient to explain what we see, or the origin of what we see or not? In the case of the origin of information, there is a clear, definitive, and categorical answer, no, they're not. In fact, this is a, this would be a category mistake to explain the origin of information by natural law. To the extent that something is law-like, it's redundant, not informational. The redu redundancy faces information content. So this, this is just, it's a non-starter. And it's one of the reasons that I think the argument for a, uh, a discrete intelligent action as opposed to the ordinary concourse of God upholding the laws of nature is necessary to account for the origin of information. Now, I want to go a little bit further than that as well, because in the question of biological origins, which I didn't get to discuss, I think the, there are also very serious issues with respect to the creative power of the standard evolutionary mechanisms that are on offer. The standard one is the mutation selection mechanism. 
Um, and I will talk about this a bit in my afternoon talk in the Science Network. But I think it's very important, just as it's important for Christians to embrace the best science that we have, it's also important for Christians to be appropriately skeptical about claims that exceed what the evidence shows. And one very strange phenomenon, which I have, uh, very interesting phenomenon, which I described in my next book, Darwin's Doubt, is that there is now a huge disparity between what public spokesmen for contemporary neo-Darwinian theory say in public about the theory, about its status. Richard Dawkins is famous for saying, if you doubt neo-Darwinian evolution, you're either stupid, wicked, or insane. Eugenie Scott in our country, of the National Center for Science Education, says there are no weaknesses in evolutionary theory. All the major science organizations have public statements that they've issued saying there are no controversial elements to current neo-Darwinian biological evolution. But when you get into the technical peer-reviewed literature in biology, you find that leading evolutionary biologists are now calling for a new theory of evolution because natural selection acting on mutations is understood not to be sufficient to create the origin of fundamentally new forms of life. Major book, MIT Press, 2004, collection of essays, including one from Simon Conway Morris, who, by the way, says we are in a post-Darwinian world. This collection of essays, the origin of organismal form, it's two leading evolutionary biologists write an introductory essay. They list, a, a, they list unanswered questions in biology. One is the Cambrian explosion, the subject of my next book. The other closely related question is the origin of the biological form itself. They say neo-Darwinism is still the canonical theory in biology, but it has no theory of the generative. It can't explain. It does a great job. Other, others have said neo-Darwinism explains the survival, but not the arrival of the fittest. It doesn't do a good job explaining the origin of form itself. Now, in my afternoon talk, I'll explain why there are several reasons the mechanism fails. Um, one of them does relate to something Ard said. He said that in, in the case of whales, um, uh, this is a great example of evolution. Well, maybe it is evolution in the sense of change over time. But uh, I have a colleague, Richard Sternberg, an evolutionary biologist who is at the, the Smithsonian and NIH, is now with our lab at the Biologic Institute, who has done a population genetics analysis and an anatomical analysis on whales. There are literally hundreds of anatomical innovations in whales. One very sexy one is the whale testes. Um, in most organisms, uh, in most mammals, the testes have to descend from the body cavity. We're mostly guys here, but there are some of these companies that will be as discreet as possible. Um, and that's, the, the sperm has to be kept cool. So whales, uh, for their aquatic mammals, you don't want um, those things dragging in the water. So the creator put them inside the body cavity. But that creates a problem, warms up the sperm. But an anatomical innovation exists in, in aquatic mammals. It's called it's a countercurrent heat exchange system. It works on the same principle as a radiator. It's a fascinating, complex adaptation. And there are dozens of these in aquatic mammals that do not exist in the presumed land based common ancestor. Why is that interesting? You do a genetic analysis on this, you start making calculations using standard equations of population genetics about population, or about population sizes, generation times, and mutation rates, and to generate, and the calculations that Sternberg has made suggest that it would take 43 million years to generate two coordinated adapted mutations in the whale, in the whale line. Just two, but there are hundreds needed. So the, it's, a, it's a, one of many reasons for doubting the neo-Darwinian mechanism, because the standard population genetics ways of a map, that is, the neo-Darwinian map is population genetics. You plug the figures in, for most of the major evolutionary transitions. And the Neo-Darwinian map is showing that the Neo-Darwinian mechanism lacks the creative power necessary to generate these major anatomical innovations. So I think just as we need to be aware there are lots of Christians in science and that's good, we also need, need to be aware of false consensus in, in um, science and, and, and to be aware that even secular evolutionary biologists are questioning what many Christians are saying, hey, we have to accept so that we'll have credibility in the secular world. Not sure that's the case. So it's a cautionary note there, and I have too much time also. I think one interesting point that, that you made, Stephen, which I agree with, is you quoted Dawkins, who said, you know, if someone tells you they don't believe in evolution, they're either you know, ignorant or possibly even wicked. And what, what he's essentially doing, and what, the way a lot of his rhetoric goes is as follows. Here is evidence from the geological record for change over time. That's evolution. Evolution means 
There's nothing but blind prejudice and difference. And so they're using scientific arguments for evolution number one, natural history, and saying that these are the same as the arguments for evolution number three, which is a, a kind of naturalist take on the world. In fact, it's a, it's a pretty naive naturalist take on the world. And I think it's really important that we expose that at every point. And so when somebody says there's a lot of evidence for evolution, I always say, wait, whoa, 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 what do you mean? Right? Do you mean natural history? Well, there's it's pretty overwhelming evidence for natural history. Um, is evidence for evolution for its stochastic processes over time in the change? I think it's pretty overwhelming. But, exa but what exactly happened from A to B to C? There's a lot of things we don't know. It's important to keep that clear. I think what's also interesting is that we're realizing this argument we're having, or if there is even a debate, is really one about science. And then the question is, how do we adjudicate these kinds of things? Well, the way that the community of scholars should adjudicate these, should adjudicate these things is by thinking about the long, by having experts spend their lives studying various aspects of this. And it is a sociological fact that a very large number of Christians who study these things think that something like evolution, like natural selection, explains pretty well the change over time. But maybe they're wrong, maybe it goes wrong, maybe Stephen is right and we've all been wrong. Um, I think it's important not to say, well, it's not science, therefore we can't do that. I think we should think about these things and see whether we can find counter-arguments. And so the point really is, is, one of the things I think has been unhelpful is that a lot of this debate has happened effectively in, pop in public, often by people who are not experts on this, and I think it's unhelpful, and uh, both apologetically and, and often pastorally, for people to engage this way. I think it's also an unfortunate um, aspect of the modern evangelical church is that we don't really have the kinds of institutions um, in place where these things, tr trust institutions where these things can be properly worked out. Having said that, let me just give you one a little bit of a feel from why the kinds of impossibility arguments that um, Stephen is giving often don't have a lot of traction in the academic world. And part of that is a sociological argument. So here is Evelyn Fox Keller, a famous physicist turned biologist turned philosopher. All right, so it's not working. So the, the point, this does, doesn't matter too much because um, I can do this um, by explaining. The point is, is that so she gave an argument for um, in her class on uh, dimensional analysis, which your engineers will understand. You say, you know, if you've got a speed and you have a length, then you can extract a time from it. And at the end, one of her students raised his hand and said, excuse me, ma'am, how do you know that's true? Have you done the experiment? And the reason for basically that skepticism is what, what I tried to explain to you, that biology is full of surprises. It's tremendously hard in biology to say a priori this couldn't have happened, that could, have ha could not have happened. You have to do kind of, you have to search through all the possibilities that there could be. And biologists continuously surprise us in all kinds of different ways. Let me give you one example. A protein, as you saw, is made of amino acids. If I have a whole bunch of amino acids in a row, right, then I can ask myself how many different configurations could that protein have? Well, if I say at the first order there are five angles between each one, I've got five times five times five times five. I really quickly get the number of configurations that a protein can have is, is so large that it will take longer than the age of the universe to search that space. And this is famously called the Leventhal Paradox, a paradox that suggests that um, uh, there's no way that you can search through all the configurations of the protein to find its final state. Proteins, nevertheless, continuously do fold right into this very unique ground state, one of a gazillion different ground states. And the question is, how do they achieve this amazing feat? Because it seems impossible. The number of the combinatorial explosion of possible states is unbelievably big. And the reason they achieve this feat is because there's a mistake in the way that argument is formulated. It's not the case that proteins randomly search through the space. Rather, there's a, there's a guide that's sort of a funnel like search. It's just a naive way of thinking about search. And that's why proteins are able to fold. We know it's true because we see it in front of us. And so, analogically, you can make similar kind of arguments about the combinatorial explosions you see in evolution of time. So if I, can, if I got my, my computer to work, I'll have shown you um, some work that we've recently done on folding of RNA, evolution of RNA. So let's say I take a length of 15 RNA, okay? 
or it has four possible uh, bases at each vote. So there's four to the power 15, two to the power 30, a billion different sequences. And the question is, how on earth could you ever find an RNA in those billion multiple sequences? Well, I kind of got one phenotypic thing, which is the shape. So RNA is formed into particular shapes. And then there's 431 shapes. So that makes life easier. I can, as if I assume that I just want to find a shape that's a probability of 1 in 431. But then I ask myself, how are these shapes distributed over that space of a billion sequences? And it turns out that just 26 of them take up 50% of the sequence space. So if I just grab a sequence at random, I've got a 1 in 2 chance of getting one of these 26 most common ones. And so I've gone from a billion to 1 in 26. What's interesting is we've looked at a lot of RNAs in nature, and they're all very much biased towards those very easy to find states. That explains why in experiment you can take a random RNAs, called static experiments, and you can find things like the hammerhead ribozyme, which is an active um, acatalytic RNA, again and again and again, with a very small number of, of random things, because the search is not random, the search is highly structured. And what that, the reason I'm bringing this up is because biology is full of these kinds of surprises. You can say, well, it couldn't possibly happen because I made this combinatorial argument. But once you start understanding a little bit more about it and getting the details, it turns out that it has all kinds of clever ways of getting around our, our, our impossibilities. And that, this last thing I'll say, that is in stark contrast to fine-tuning arguments in cosmology where we can do the counterfactuals. It's because physics is much simpler than biology. So if I give you a fine-tuning argument in cosmology, say the, and the resonance in carbon, which is just the right energy to allow stellar nuclear synthesis to make carbon, oxygen, etc. The reason why that's a powerful argument, why it's not a contested argument, is because I can show you what happens when those levels are up and down. I can show you what the combinatorial space looks like. I can show you that this thing that we see is in fact rare. So, is it true that these combinatorial explosions make it impossible for evolution to find things? We don't know yet. But we're so far away from ever knowing. It's such a complicated question. We're so far away that I think really we should take a step back and allow the community of scholars to engage in this and think about these things and see where we come before we try to use it in public or in, even in the projects.